Good morning, Grace Vineyard and all those who follow us via the various media channels. Two weeks ago, we finished looking at the Beatitudes portion of the Sermon on the Mount, when Mark Stoneham spoke about those who were persecuted because of righteousness. Last week, Jill looked at how Jesus says we are to be in the world, salt and light. This has, in a way, been the text for the sermon and the introduction to the sermon that Jesus is about to share with his congregation, his disciples and those sitting on the hillside listening to him. So today we are, not, we are going to start to dig into the body of the sermon. Today and for the next six weeks, we are going to be going through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. We are not going to be doing a verse by verse study like we have done so far, but begin to look at larger portions of scripture and try to bring out the main points from the portion that we look at. We plan to complete the series on the last Sunday of July. Today we are looking at Matthew chapter 5 and verses 17 to 32. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is, un is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. It is generally accepted among biblical scholars that the first verse of this portion of scripture is the most important verse in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 17 Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. R.T. Kendall, in his book, the Sermon on the Mount says this. 
Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that the promise to fulfill the law and the prophets was the most stupendous claim Jesus ever made. Think about this, that Jesus would himself literally fulfill the law during his lifetime. No person ever made such a promise or accomplished what he did. Jesus says he has not come to do away with the law and the prophets. A reference to what we now call the Old Testament, the Jewish Holy Scriptures, but rather to fulfill them. The law given to Moses and written down in the first five books of the Old Testament is known as the Mosaic Law and is best seen in three parts. The Moral Law, the Ten Commandments, the Ceremonial Law, the way God wanted his people to worship and offer sacrifices, and the civil law, the way the people of Israel were to be governed. The law was in place because of sin, and it was always meant to be a temporary measure as far as God was concerned. It needed someone who was without sin to fulfill the law, to satisfy the requirements of God and the law, and bring in a new era of living in relationship with God. God had this plan in place before the beginning of time. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 tells us this. For he chose us in him, Jesus, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God already had the plan of salvation in place before the creation of the world. That is just mind-boggling to think that God had already set in motion the events of Jesus' life, death and resurrection before the world was even created. He knew who would screw up and yet still chose to create us and give us free will. Jesus, in claiming he, was, he will fulfill the law, says a lot about himself. No one had ever made this claim before. No one had ever been able to fulfill the law before. He goes on to say that the law will be in place in its fullness until it is fulfilled. Jesus lived out the law throughout his life, fulfilling all the rites and ceremonies that he had to do, offering the sacrifices and attend the annual festivals in Jerusalem. He did all this. And that was why the last thing that Jesus said before he died on the cross was, It is finished. John 19.30 Meaning that he had completed his mission of fulfilling the law, completely, including being the pure and spotless sacrificial lamb that was slain to take away the sins of the world and remove the need for the Passover lamb ever to be sacrificed again. Now we read these scriptures with the full knowledge of what Jesus has done for us. His disciples and those listening to him had no clue as to what he was talking about. They only understood it after his resurrection and the day of Pentecost. They understood the law. They were schooled in it. But their expectations of the Messiah were very different from the reality of Christ. They expected a revolutionary who was going to overthrow the Roman oppression, not a lamb who was going to be slain. They tried to follow the law, but were unable to keep it fully. The Pharisees and teachers of the law tried as best as they could to stick to the letter of the law, but they did not understand the spirit of the law. We are instructed to keep and teach the commandments of Jesus. Love God, love one another. The new commandment that he gave us. If we do, we will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, having said that he would fulfill the law and prophets, begins to look at the law, at the commandments, what we call the Ten Commandments, and teach them from his point of view not from the view of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And he doesn't begin with the first commandment, as you would expect him to do, but jumps in at number six, do not murder. 
Now, if you were sitting in the crowd, you might think that that is not a problem for you. You haven't plotted against and killed anyone, so you are safe. That was how the Pharisees and the teachers of the law interpreted it. But it was not how Jesus interprets it. He doesn't just look at the outward physical expression of this command, but looks like God did so many times before and since at the heart of the person. Remember how when David was chosen to be the next king of Israel, it was not because of his good looks. His older brothers were better looking than him. But it was his heart that was turned towards God, that God pointed out to Samuel, and he anointed David to be the next king. Jesus explains that murder, the physical act of ending someone's life, is not the only thing that he is concerned about. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were only concerned with the direct interpretation of the law. The commandments. But Jesus takes it to the next level and says it is how we think about and behave towards others around us, our brothers and sisters, our neighbours, that God looks at as well. We are not to get angry with them. What is happening in our minds and hearts concerns God too. How we behave towards our neighbours. What we think about them is important to Him. He sees our hearts and knows our thoughts. We cannot hide them from Him. We will be judged by God when He sits on the judgment seat and we stand before Him. Not to determine whether we are going to heaven or to hell, but what rewards we, re we will receive. Will they pass through the fire of judgment? Paul speaks about this testing by fire in his first letter to the Corinthians. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burnt up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 11 to 15. We need to be aware that our words are powerful and can cause destruction in other people's lives as well as our own. We need to watch what we say to, to and about others as well as what we speak over our own lives. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire and, it, and is itself set on fire by hell. James chapter 3 and verse 6. The tongue speaks what is in our hearts, our very being. But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Matthew chapter 15 verses 18 to 19. We are to watch what we think and what we say. Above all else, guard your hearts, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Our hearts and minds need to be pure before God. And if we have any issues with anyone on earth, God wants us to be the ones to make things right with our brothers and sisters. Whether we are in the right or in the wrong, we need to be reconciled to those around us. And we need to make the effort to set, set things right before we find ourselves in a heap of trouble. Especially if we are about to celebrate communion, we need to make sure we have no outstanding quarrels or issues with anyone. Now there is a lot more that I could say about this topic, but time does not permit me to say it now. 
Jesus then moves on to the next commandment, the seventh commandment. Do not commit adultery. The Pharisees take on this commandment was that it was all about the physical act of having sex with someone who was not your marriage partner. Their take was that it was something that only a married person could do. If you were unmarried, you would be accused of fornication, not adultery. The punishment under the law for adultery was death by stoning. Now this could be the reason why the woman caught in adultery and brought before Jesus by the teachers of the law and the Pharisees was on her own. The man was obviously not married, so was not committing adultery, but fornication, and was not condemned to die by stoning. Jesus, on the other hand, once again makes it an issue of the heart and mind, and not just a physical act. He addresses the seventh commandment, the light in, in the light of the tenth commandment, which says, do not covet your neighbor's wife. We covet with our minds and hearts. Adultery can be committed in the mind without there ever being any sexual contact between the two people. When a man looks at a woman and has sexual desires running through his mind, Jesus says this is just as if the man had sexual relations with the woman. It is the same for a woman who sees a man and has sexual desires running through her mind. She too might just as well have slept with the man. Generally, sexual stimulation happens differently in men and women. Men, generally, are sexually aroused by what they see. Now, that is why pornogra pornography is such a problem for men, far more so than for women. Women, generally, are sexually aroused by physical touch. This is why Jesus says that we are to gouge out the right eye and cut off the right hand if it causes us to sin. He is addressing the way that men and women are generally sexually aroused and what we are to do to stop it. Stop it at the source. Don't let it run the full course. Does Jesus mean that we are physically to gouge out our eye and cut off our hand? No, he's speaking metaphorically. Paul the Apostle puts it this way in his letter to, to the Corinthians. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. How do we do that? He gives us a way in his second letter to the Corinthians. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The enemy, the devil, will try all sorts of tricks and tactics to get us to fall. But as soon as a thought comes into our minds that we know is not right or could lead us to sin, we are to take it captive. Stop it at that point. Let the thought not develop any further and bring it under the authority and obedience of Christ. Now to be tempted is not a sin. Scripture says Jesus was tempted in every way that we are tempted. To give in to the temptation is when we sin. When we are being tempted by the devil, we need to stand strong on God's words and promises. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4 and verse 7. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. We are to offer ourselves to God when we are being tempted 
and stand strong in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And the devil has to flee. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit and we are not to violate his temple. In closing, I want to address the last portion of this passage, the part on divorce. I'm once again going to quote from R.T. Kendall in his book, The Sermon on the Mount. He says, These verses, alongside Jesus' other references to marriage and divorce, are among the most misunderstood of his statements. Some people build their whole case on divorce on these verses, often forgetting the context as well as the views of the Apostle Paul. We must not forget that these verses, Matthew chapter 5 verses 31 and 32, are put in the Sermon on the Mount in the context of Jesus' teaching on adultery. It is how the seventh commandment is interpreted that will show the way forward. It is important to realize that Jesus has not changed the subject. The issue here can be summed up in one word, lust. Adultery is committed when one is divorcing to remarry because of lust. The issue of desertion, Paul's view in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is not covered here. Neither is covered here the issue of divorce when lust is not the real motivation. Jesus only uses marriage and divorce as illustrations of how people can commit adultery. When they divorce to remarry and when they, when they divorce because of lust. Sadly, the NIV treats it as if it were a new subject, separate from adultery, and gives it a separate heading. It is not a new subject. Jesus has not changed the subject from adultery to marriage and divorce. He is using divorce as a further illustration of how some commit adultery, namely by remarrying because they prefer another person, the reason being lust. Let us pray, and then we'll look at the questions for the breakout rooms. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, te for your teachings today. I thank you, Father, that you help us to understand what you're saying to us. I thank you, Lord, that as we listen to these words, as we hear them, we will take on board what you are saying to us. Help us, Lord, to be aware of what we, what we look at, how we look at things, and that you would help us to control our minds and our thoughts when they run away with us. Lord, I thank you that you loved us from the beginning. You had a plan in place from the very beginning. That even before the creation of the world, you had set in motion Jesus' death and resurrection to set us free from our sin. Thank you that you had planned to send us your Holy Spirit, who is with us and dwells within us, and that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and that you help us to resist evil, to resist temptation, and to focus on you, to set our eyes on you, to fix our eyes on you. And when the enemy comes at us, that we can stand strong on your word and on your promises. And that as we stand on your word, stand on your promises, we resist the devil. We submit ourselves to you. Resist the devil and he has to flee. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us, Father, to spend each day aware of who we are as children of the living God. Aware of the presence and the power that we have with the Holy Spirit in us. And that we are able to resist the devil because we submit ourselves to you. And Father, I pray for those who do not know you, that they would come to you and submit their lives to you and begin to understand who you are and what you've done for them, to set them free from the sin that they caught up in. And as they submit themselves to you, you give them the power to resist the attacks of the enemy. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray this and ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.